Halloween's Lightburner presents The Mythical Astronomer of Ice and Fire Con of Thrones 2018 Discussion Panel Nature Cycle Mythology With Ideas of Ice and Fire Crow Food's daughter, and Lucifer means light bringer. You're on, Greyjoy. <laughs> Wish they had given Euron a parrot. <laughs> Seems like they left that one on the table there. Some sort of satanic parrot. <laughs> Might be a record low for Daenerys cosplays this year. It is. There's not a lot going on. There are. I just rode the escalator with an amazing Danny cosplay. I don't know where she is, but she. I saw a really nice winter winter dress Danny earlier. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was sick. Oh yeah. Yeah, I gave her. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> Branching out a little. Where are my dragons? Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to the Nature Cycle Mythology panel. I am LML, which stands for Lucifer means light bringer which it does, it's mythology. Uh, and I host the Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire podcast to talk about symbolism and mythology. And it's lots and lots of fun, way more fun than it sounds. Hello, go ahead, Quinn. I'm Quinn from Ideas of Ice and Fire. Um, on YouTube, I talk about mainly the Song of Ice and Fire books. I focus on archetypes and symbols and also the themes of the story, so yeah. And my name is Amanda. I go by Crow Food's Daughter in the forums. Um, I have a YouTube channel called The Disputed Lands where I discuss a lot of mysterious things within the storyline, like the Black Oily Stone, different things within the Ironborn culture. Um, huh. Yeah, if you like Ironborn mythology, Disputed Lands, do not miss it. And of course, Mr. Quinn here has a lot of great videos, one of which is about the children of the forest, one of my favorites. YouTube videos ever made about this subject, so check out Ideas of Ice and Fire, Children of the Forest. So we're actually going to touch on some of that today. This is the Nature Cycle Mythology panel, and I pitched this idea for this con because I think Nature Cycle Mythology is actually some of the most important mythology to understand in order to get the sort of larger conflict uh, context of the books. And Norse mythology is a big one, uh, you know, Zoroastrianism and Persian mythology, I think everyone's familiar with that, War of the Roses, comic book influences are in A Song of Ice and Fire, it's all kinds of stuff. Uh, but nature cycle mythology is really awesome. So we've got things in A Song of Ice and Fire informed by nature mythology like Robert Baratheon, I'm sure you guys looked at the stag antlers here, you're thinking House Baratheon, that's exactly right. We've got the Starks and the ancient Kings of Winter, uh, Garth the Green, the Barrow King, Cold Hands of the Night's Watch, Zombies in general, even Patchface, all comes from Nature Cycle Mythology. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that today. So what is Nature Cycle Mythology? Well, there's actually a great example of Nature Cycle Mythology in the world of ice and fire when we are told about Garth the Green. And so I will read this for you. Garth Greenhand, we call him, but in the oldest tales he is named Garth Greenhair or simply Garth the Green. Some stories say he had green hands, green hair, or green skin overall. A few even gave him antlers like a stag. Others tell us that he dressed in green from head to foot, and certainly this is how he's most commonly depicted in paintings, tapestries, and sculptures. More likely, his sobriquet derived from his gifts as a gardener, a tiller of the soil, the one trait on which all the tales agree. Garth made the corn ripen, the trees fruit, and the flowers bloom, the singers tell us. A few of the very oldest tales of Garth Greenhand present us with a considerably darker deity, one who demanded blood sacrifice from his worshippers to ensure a bountiful harvest. In some stories, the green god dies every autumn when the trees lose their leaves, only to be reborn with the coming of spring. This version of Garth is largely forgotten, but not here, ladies and gentlemen. Many of the more primitive peoples of the earth worship a fertility god or goddess, and Garth Greenhand has much and more in common with these deities. 
And in fact, this is actually George breaking the fourth wall here and telling you that Garth the Green has much in common with the Earth's nature deities. And indeed, he basically is ripped right out of European folklore. So Garth the Green dies in the autumn and then resurrects in the spring. And he's basically a personification of nature. When nature loses its green and goes into hibernation, Garth dies. And that's what happens to Sir Nunos and the Green Man and Garth's mythological ancestors. And so he's basically acting out the cycle of the seasons as a person. And this, the cycle of the seasons, of course, is something that pretty obvious, pretty noticeable. It defines life when you live outside, as we all used to. So this is basically like the clockwork of the story. And it's not just the cycle of the seasons, but actually three different cycles. And that I'll kick it to Amanda. Yes, so there are three different cycles that our world actually turns on. Okay. So there are three cycles in which our world does turn on. And those are the cycles of the seasons, the cycles of day and night, and also the cycles of life and death. So with the cycle of seasons, in our world, the seasons are unwavering. They're predictable. So with every spring, we know that it's going to turn into a summer. With every winter, we know that it's gonna turn into a spring. It's unwavering, and it's something that we take for granted in our world, because it's, you know when it's gonna happen. Just like that, um, similarly, day and night. It's another cycle that we take for granted here in our world. Like the cycling of the seasons, um, the cycling of the sun, or more so the rotation of the earth, is also something that is predictable and unwavering. We know that with every night, there will come a new dawn. Lastly, with birth, life, death, old age, it's just another cycle. Like the seasons, the cycling of life and death is also extremely crucial. Babies continue to be born. Those babies grow up and have babies of their own. And eventually, we will all will grow old and one day die. It's just the natural order of things. Life will always cycle in development, from birth, adulthood, old age, and eventually death. So these three cycles go right to the very heart of our story. The cycling of the seasons is an extremely important part of the Song of Ice and Fire series. It's one of the key unique features that George has built into the world. It's unpredictable. Winters will last years, summers will last years. Nobody will ever know how long a winter is gonna last. Nobody knows how long their summer is going to last. Similarly, life and death cycle is also extremely important. Look at all of the zombies and resurrections we see throughout the storyline. We see Whites, Lady Stoneheart, Beric Dondarrion, Khal Drogo. We got Patchface, Robert Strong, and even cold hands, so many different examples. And finally, day and night, another big deal. So the long night was pretty important. As this quote by Old Man suggests, the long night violates all three of these cycles. Thousands and thousands of years ago, a winter fell that was cold and hard and endless beyond all memory of man. There came a night that lasted a generation. In that darkness, the others came for the first time. She says as her needles went click, click, click. They were cold things, dead things, that hated iron and fire and the touch of the sun and every creature with hot blood in its veins. So there we go. Winter refuses to give way to spring. A winter fell that was cold and hard and endless Night refuses to give way to dawn. A night that lasted a generation. And finally, the dead walk and they kill the living. The others came for the first time. They were cold things. They were dead things. So you can see how important the nature cycle is to A Song of Ice and Fire. Essentially, the one thing that's different about this universe is that these cycles are all messed up. And the long night is kind of like the original sin that has shaped the world ever since. Everything that's come after, it's, it's implied in the world of ice and fire that the seasons perhaps used to be regular. But this long night event somehow disrupted the, the cycle of the seasons 
It disrupted the day-night cycle, and of course we have the dead refusing to stay dead, stubbornly getting out of their graves and killing the living. And so this is basically a complete mockery and an inversion of nature cycle mythology, and that's what the long night is. That's why it's such a sin. That's why I call it an original sin. It's violating the very order of nature. It's important to understand that winter and death and night by themselves aren't necessarily bad or evil, because they are too part of that cycle, and there's a really good quote in A Dance with Dragons about that. So, they did sing. They sang in the true tongue, so Bran could not understand the words. But their voices were as pure as winter air. Where are the rest of you? Bran asked Leif once. Gone down into the earth, she answered. Into the stones, into the trees. Before the first men came, all this land that you call Westeros was home to us. Yet even in those days, we were few. The gods gave us long lives, but not great numbers. Lest we overrun the world as deer will overrun a wood, where there are no wolves to hunt them. That was in the dawn of days, when our sun was rising. Now it sinks, and this is our long dwindling. The giants are almost gone as well. Those, they who are our bane and our brothers. The great lions of the western hills have been slain. The unicorns are all but gone. The mammoths down to a few hundred. The dire wolves will outlast us all, but their time will come as well. In the world that men have made, there is no room for them or us. She seemed sad when she said it, and that made Bran sad as well. It was only later that he thought, men would not be sad. Men would be wroth. Men would hate and swear a bloody vengeance. The singers sing sad songs where men would fight and kill. The children of the forest really understand the need for harmony and balance in a way that men don't. She says men would fight and kill. That hints that men are more willing to violate the nature cycle than the children necessarily would be because they're literally nature spirits. And there are some extreme examples of people that violate this cycle that we'll get into later. But only death can pay for life isn't just about blood magic. Old plants die, they make the ground fertile, and new plants rise from that. Um, Eddard's death makes room for new characters to grow and fill the little void in the plot. And there's even like stories about old men in the north that will like walk off to go hunting, but they're really just walking off to die so that the young have a chance. And there's also a quote about that. Alice sighed. My father took so many of our men south with him that only the women and young boys were left to bring the harvest in. Them and the men too old or crippled to go off to war. Crops withered in their fields or were pounded into the mud by autumn rains. And now the snows are come. This winter will be hard. Few of the old people will survive it, and many children will perish as well. It was a tale that any Northman knew well. My father's grandmother was the Flint of the Mountains. On his mother's side, John told her. The first Flints, they called themselves. They say the other Flints are the blood of younger sons, who had to leave the mountains to fight food and land and wives. It has always been a harsh life up there, when the snows fall and food grows scarce. Their young must travel to Wintertown or take service at one castle or the other. The old men gather up what strength remains in them and announce they are going hunting. Some are found come spring, more are never seen again. It is much the same at Carthol. So like the children of the forest, these men are more willing to accept their place. They understand that the new era must come. Exactly, so really what we're talking about here is harmony and balance. These three cycles are like clockwork and they keep things in check. Just like the children of the forest talked about, you know, the deer can't overrun the wood. Everything has to have its place. And there comes a time when it's time to say goodbye and exit stage left and let your kids and grandkids take the place. And I think uh, the example of Eddard is really great because from a narrative purpose, it's the same thing. It's like if Eddard had lived, then nobody else has room. Rob doesn't become the king of the north and try to stake his own claim, the Stark family, everything is different. So what one of the brilliant things that George is given credit for doing in A Game of Thrones is giving you Ned as a main character and then killing him. And you're like, oh my God, what just happened? But then when you read the whole series, you see his death actually just created room for all the other characters to sort of grow up and become the next generation of Starks. So these cycles, they're like I said, they're like clockwork. They govern the turning of everything, and by doing this long night thing and disrupting them, George is really calling our attention to him. And the other way he's calling our attention to this nature cycle mythology is by sticking antlers on people's heads, which he's done in many places. And that will be our next section. Garth the Green and the Brothers Baratheon. 
So we've got three main horned god figures in the books. We've got Garth and his Baratheon family. We've got the Durand, uh, and the Durandans before him, I should say. We've got the Sacred Order of Green Men, and we have, um, okay, yeah, so Garth, the Baratheons, and the Green Men. So starting off with the Green Men, because they're quick. In A Game of Thrones, we hear about the Green Men, and it says, Catelyn tells us that they stand silent watch on the Isle of Faces. Okay, that sounds interesting. Then uh, in a brand chapter in A Game of Thrones, it says, the Sacred Order of the Green Men was formed to keep watch over the Isle of Faces. Okay. But then in the Storm of Swords, we start to figure out what they're all about. And it says that, uh, so it's actually Bran, he's telling us uh, when they're at the night fort, and Sam comes out of the well, and he's telling them about cold hands and the elk. Uh, Bran tells us that basically the green men are said to have green skin, said to have antlers, sometimes they ride elk. And so now we've got this idea of green men with antlers, on the Isle of Faces, they sound basically like Garth the Green, but there's more than one of them, so it's very mysterious. And this is something that George has said he's going to come back to, the Isle of Faces. But they're kind of in the background for right now, and he's just telling you, hey, this thing's going on. But much more up front in A Game of Thrones is Robert Baratheon, of course. He rides right onto the page, and here he is, basically the stag man in action. And so, of course, we know Robert Baratheon in battle wears the antlered helm. And so does Renly, and I don't know why, I guess Stans didn't get one, but uh, <laughs> most of the other Baratheons wear that. And of course, that tradition goes back to the ancient king, uh, ancient storm kings going all the way back to God knows when, Age of Heroes. They were said to wear the uh, stag crown, and of course, when Joffrey takes the throne, he's also got a kind of stag crown, not sort of as dramatic, but uh, let's see here. And then, so... The best, this is actually one of the most obvious references to nature cycle mythology, and it comes right in, uh, it's when Ned is in the, in the dungeons, locked in the black cells after he's made his power play and lost, and he's about to get killed. And he's in there reminiscing, and it says, he found himself thinking of Robert more and more. He saw the king as he had been in the flower of his youth, tall and handsome, his great antlered helm on his head, his war hammer in hand, sitting his horse like a horned god. He heard his laughter in the dark, saw his eyes blue and clear as mountain lakes. So right there, I'm telling you, Robert is a horned god. And the horned god is basically the name of this archetype. I mentioned real quick, Sir Nunos, the green man, Dionysus, Bacchus, even as far back as the Canaanite ball. Um, Osiris of Egyptian myth is actually a green skin corn god. So this, this tradition is everywhere. And George is basically just hanging a sign. be like, Robert kind of looks like a horned god now, doesn't he? So... That's a great tip off. And then you see the, uh, the Mountain Lakes reference, sort of an extra little nature god vibe there. One of the most interesting things is that Robert's reign... Connecting to the <laughs> We're all having trouble, Siri. So uh, essentially, um, so what we've got here is, um, Siri, what is Sir Nunos? <laughs> so when Robert's reigning, he's actually presiding over the, one of the longest summers in memory. That's the actual quote, the longest summer in recent memory. And then when he dies, we see the summer end almost immediately after. At the beginning of the Clash of Kings, they send out the ravens to announce that summer is over. And this is only like, in real time, got to be like days or weeks after Robert died. So Amanda's going to get into that more. But Robert is basically the summer king reigning. And when he dies, just like when Garth dies... That signals the time to turn the season. So that is a great nod to the mythology. Now, here's one of the best Garth-Robert parallels, being horny. And I mean horny. So check this quote. Garth Greenhand brought the gift of fertility with him. Nor was it only the earth that he made fecund, for the legends tell us that he could make barren women fruitful with a touch. Even crones... You get a moon blood, then you get a moon blood. <laughs> See here, so it says, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty silly quote, so you just got to embrace it. The legend tells that he could make barren women fruitful to touch, even crones whose moon blood no longer flowed, maidens ripened in his presence, mothers brought forth twins, or even triplets when he blessed them. Oh boy. Uh, young girls flowered at his smile. A little bit creepy. Lords and, <laughs> lords and common men alike offered up their virgin daughters to him. That's definitely creepy. Wherever he went, uh, that their crops might ripen and their trees grow heavy with fruit. There was never a maid that he deflowered who did not deliver a strong son or fair daughter nine months later, or so the stories say. And of course, Robert Baratheon had 16 bastards. So it's kind of over the top, hitting you with it. 
this is a horned god and he likes to make other horned gods. <laughs> so, then we've got Renly. Renly's awesome, perhaps even better. So Renly, uh, Robert dies like a horned god and the horned god is supposed to be resurrected. Robert doesn't get resurrected. However, I mean, we can keep our fingers crossed, but I think he's past that time. So when uh, Catelyn sees Renly in A Clash of Kings, we get this great quote that sort of implies Robert as resurrected, and it says, In their midst, watching and laughing with his young queen by his side, sat a ghost in a golden crown. Small wonder the lords gathered round him with such fervor, she thought, he is Robert come again. So there you go, Robert's resurrected. Then we've got uh, Renly's crown. It's a stag's head of dark green jade adorned with golden eyes and golden antlers. And then he's got the uh, same thing on his tunic, the horned god. So this is leading up to the scene where Renly gets murdered in a tent, basically. And so we've got Rob, uh, Renly, like Robert's ghost, come again. Of course, Renly actually wears green armor in addition to the antlers. And he is very clearly associated with Summer. The king's armor was a deep green, the green of leaves in a summer wood. So dark it drank the candlelight. Gold highlights gleamed from inlay and fastenings, like distant <laughs> fires in that wood, winking every time he moved. So not only is Renly's armor like the green of summer, it's giving you this image of a campfire in a dark wood, the kind of campfire you might gather around to worship the horn god. So it's very, very vibey there. But then, of course, there is the famous Knights of Summer quote. Lord Rowan, beside her, did not join in the merriment. They are all so young, he said. It was true. The Knight of Flowers could not have reached his second name day when Robert slew Rager, Prince Rhaegar on the trident. Few of the others were much older. They had been babes during the sack of King's Landing, and no more than boys when Balon Greyjoy raised the Iron Islands in rebellion. They are still unbloodened, Catelyn thought. Catelyn thought as she watched Lord Bryce goad Sir Robar into juggling a brace of daggers. It is all a game to them, still. Attorney writ large, and all they see is a chance for glory and honor and spoils. There are boys drunk on song and story, and like all boys, they think themselves immortal. War will make them old, Catelyn said, as it did us. She had been a girl when Robert and Ned and John Aaron raised their banners against Ares Targaryen. A woman, by the time the fighting was done. I pity them. Why? Lord Rowan asked her. Look at them. They're young and strong and full of life and laughter and lust. I, more lust than they know what to do with. There will be many a bastard bread this night, I promise you. Why pity? Because it will not last, Catelyn answered sadly. Because they are nights of summer and winter is coming. Lady Catelyn thought, you're wrong. Brienne regarded her with eyes as blue as her armor. Winter will never come for the likes of us. Should we die in battle, they will surely sing of us, and it's always summer in the songs. In songs, all nights are gallant, all maids beautiful, and the sun is always shining. Winter comes for all of us, Catelyn thought. For me, it came when Ned died. It will come for you too, child, and sooner than you like. So there you go, you've got the Knights of Summer, they're young, they're horny, they're lusty, they're making bastards, they're drunk, they're happy, they're juggling daggers. It's all a game. Until that night when Renly dies. And when they wake up the next day, they will be disillusioned. Their summer will be over. There will be no more juggling. They will now be going over to serve Stannis and his demon god, or scattering to the winds and trying to figure out what to do. So summer is definitely over. And you notice this line at the end, winter came for all of us, Catelyn thought. For me, it came when Ned died. So this is kind of sweet. Ned is basically Catelyn's green man. And when he dies, her summer is over. So this is, this is it's sad, but it's, this is more nature cycle mythology here. And you'll see how all the seasons in the life cycle are overlaid with each other. They're young, they think they're immortal, but winter will come for them and make them old <laughs> and bitter and teach them sadness. So we're seeing, again, Martin is just, these cycles are laid over top of each other like clockwork. Now, Renly's death, it's more horn god mythology, and it starts in the green tent where the candles within Renly's pavilion made the shimmering silken wall seem to glow, transforming the great tent into a magical castle alive with emerald light. And Quinn, I think I'm just going to paraphrase this so we can keep it moving a little bit. I'm just going to have him read the whole thing. But so he puts on uh, in the death scene, he puts on his antlers and his green armor, and it's called out. It said it would add a foot and a half to his height, 
And it's, then he says, basically, Catelyn's trying to talk him out of fighting. And he turns to her and he says, the time for talk is done. Now we see who is stronger, which is quintessential horn god mythology. I kind of skipped over that part, but the horn god also represents male virility and strength and like the wild, untamed strength of a stag. And it's kind of the mother goddess who, who gentles that. So here's Renly saying, basically, I am the stag man and I'm going to show my strength and we're going to fight. But of course, that doesn't happen. The shadow comes in and the candles gutter out, shivering. Renly says cold, right as his throat is cut, the blood comes gushing out. And it says, a sheet of blood creeping down the front of his armor, a dark red tide that drowned his green and gold. So his green and gold, his summer colors are being drowned out in blood. And of course, cutting someone across the throat is the traditional way to sacrifice either an animal or a person, if, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, so then, and the last thing is that uh, when the, it says, when the shadow, uh, death came in that door and blew the life out of him as swift as the wind snuffed out his candles. So we're given Renly's life is like a candle, like the Summer King, it's fire, it's warmth. And when the cold shadow comes in, it extinguishes his life, it extinguishes all the candles. Renly says cold. So he's showing you summer turning to winter, it's death and the cold is all coming at once. So here's the thing, Renly dies, very sad, but of course we all know Renly is also resurrected. And even more vividly than that line about Renly looking like Robert come again, uh, because we have Dantos describing the fight at the Battle of the Blackwater, where Garland Tyrell wore Renly's armor, and it says, Lord Renly in his green armor with the fires shimmering off his golden antlers. Lord Renly with his tall spear in hand. So we've got this idea of a ghostly, fiery, reincarnated Renly. He's come back to lay vengeance. And it says, this is a captain speaking to Davos about the Blackwater. It says, King Renly's shade was seen as well, the captain said slaying right and left as he led the Lion Lord's van. It said his green armor took a ghostly glow from the wildfire and his antlers ran with golden flame. And the very best is Hamish the Harpist at the Purple Wedding. It says his fingers moved across the strings of the high harp, filling the room with sweet sound. From his throne of bones, the Lord of Death looked down on the murdered Lord. Hamish began and went on to tell how Renly, repenting his attempt to usurp his nephew's crown, had defied the Lord of Death himself and crossed back to the land of the living to defend the realm against his brother. So, I mean, it couldn't be any more vivid. And there you have it. We've got a couple of resurrected, antlered green men in Robert and Renly, and it's right from European folklore. So that is the green man, but sometimes the green man gets split in half, and that's what Amanda's gonna talk about. So yes, um, there's a very good reason why the Baratheon brothers are showing us such good examples of dying and resurrecting horn gods. As it turns out, the horn god myth has a tendency to portray uh, the use of brothers to depict the death and rebirth cycle. So, um, as, this, as the quote has said, um, from his throne of bones, the lord of death looked down upon the murdered lord. Okay. And he had defied the lord of death himself, crossed back to the land of the living to defend the realm against his brother. So as we know, knowing this, as we have all learned, Garth the Greenhand was a important godlike progenitor of the first men. Garth is depicted with horns. He's depicted with green skin. He's depicted with antlers. And he's said to be a fertility god. Knowing this, it soon becomes obvious that, Garth, that George was probably thinking about the deity Sir Nunos when he actually created Garth the Greenhand. So, um, Sir Nunos is actually also a fertility deity. Sir Nunos is also green, and he's also depicted with antlers. And just like Garth the Greenhand, uh, Sir Nunos also dies in the fall and resurrects in the spring. So, um, you can see that there's a, a very um, huge inspiration through that. But also, there is a separation. Um, there are two deities called the Oak King and the Holly King. In a Celtic folklore, the Oak King and the Holly King are seen as aspects of Sir Nunos. So these two deities actually fight each other. They're, they basically are battling and dueling endlessly to create the cycling of the season. One brother defeats or kills the other in order to make that cycle happen. And it's the way that people just kind of rationalized with, with their different religions how the seasons worked because they, you know, really didn't know. But 
Um, it's a theme found throughout um, fertility folklore. It's found everywhere. Um, as you see with the Canaanite mythology, Baal mm -hmm. is killed by his brother Mott. Emesh and Enten, personifications of summer and spring. And also we have Osiris, we have Set, Oak and Holly, all brothers, all battling the endancy. You see, the green god has to die, but they have to rationalize a way that the green god dies, and it's always, almost always through the brother. The brother always kills. One is always depicted as the lord of death, as the, the personification of winter, the personification of death. The other one is always a personification of summer, of fertility, of life. And that's how we see those cycles, the winter, the, the seasons, the life, the death, the day, the night. It's, it's always a yin and yang. Yeah, I, I chose Lord of Death. I thought that was more fun, sorry. Lord of Death is a, a good terminology. I do like that. Um, and so also, um, as we see, this is a, there's a great example of winter versus summer that can be found in the crypts that uh, we see Ned and Robert. Uh, you see, Ned and Robert are very much um, brotherly types, okay? They were fostered in the area as young boys together. They were raised together. And they often refer to each other as being like a brother. Um, and so when Ned actually takes Robert down into the crypts, it's almost like he's taking him down into the underworld is what he's doing. Um, he's taking him down where the dead are, where the kings of winter are. And Ned is always talking about, in that conversation, he's talking about winter. He's talking about death, the, the dead people resurrecting. You know, there's, there's all those personifications of, of them, like, coming out to get them. Um, there's, there's all those talk of that. But with Robert, he's talking about summer, about melons bursting. He's laughing, he's loud, he's lively. And you can just really see this interplay in between Ned oh, are and you not, Are you not going to get the quote about the, the women? The, no, the women? With the, with no. The, okay, I, you guys know the quote, though. I, I can't put enough it's emphasis. It's like they were naked, Ned. It's great. <laughs> I, I can't put enough emphasis into that without, like, cracking up. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so it's, it's you, you see, Ned is just stern and serious. He's the Lord of Death in that scene. And Robert is that fertility god. And it's almost like an interaction where they're actually dueling, um, when they're actually doing that. Um, and, and he's actually taking him down into the underworld. And that's kind of like an analog for winter, the underworld is. Um, and so anyway, with that, um, they talk about the kings of winter. So let's talk about the king of winter. The King of Winter is also a reference to this resurrecting fertility god. So um, you might have heard of something called the Wicker Man before. Um, there's a festival, I think, in the desert. In oh, bur man. yeah, Burning Man, loosely. Yeah. The guy claims he didn't get the idea from the Wicker Man, but like, dude, uh, yeah, you did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there, there was a Celtic Druidic practice where um, it is said that people were burnt alive in man-shaped wicker cages. So um, it, it's never been actually proven. This might have just been a way to demonize the Celtics by yeah, thanks, you know, saying Caesar. that they yeah, were you know, sacrificing people. But they did actually, uh, there is evidence that they actually did um, create these um, wicker, wicker men, these large um, personifications of their deity. And they would actually burn that wicker man um, in late winter in order to... Um, bring forth the spring or to commemorate it or to kind of represent that dying fertility god and, and it's the, the death of that. So there's um, uh, the king of winter is actually another pagan tradition that scholars believe stems from the wicker man. So basically sticks and shoots and straws are kind of formed together and fashioned into the likeness of a, a little man and um, yeah and so, and that's called the King of Winter. And so the King of Winter is then burned, just like the Whipper Man is, in order to allow the coming of the spring. So you can see some very interesting things uh, going into play there with, the, with the, uh, Ned and Robert in the crypts with the Kings of Winter. So, yeah. Yeah, so, I, I just, if I, could, if I could jump on that. Um, the king of winter's job is to sacrifice himself to usher in the spring. The Starks are called kings of winter. 
<laughs> you can sort of put that together. I mean, Ned, uh, George is telling you right from the get-go, the Starks are here to bring the spring, and they're probably going to have to sacrifice themselves to do it. And that fits with probably everything that we expect from the Starks. That's basically what they're good at doing is dying, unfortunately. And I think that, uh, yeah, I know, I'm sorry, but it's, it's, they are good at it. Uh, and I think, you know, John's going to get resurrected. He's obviously already died, and he's going to get resurrected like a green man. And John is a King of Winter figure. Uh, however, is John going to stay resurrected? Like in the shows, Zombie John is all good. He's ready to have babies, and he's, he's chilling. In the books, Zombie John is not going to be that pretty um, from everything that we've seen with Cold Hands, Barrack, and Stoneheart. And his existence is not going to be super fun. And I would expect that when John is done, he's probably going to be setting his burden down. So, to talk more about life and death, is Mr. Quinn. All right, time for the life-death cycle. Now, the cycle of life and death is at the very center of A Song of Ice and Fire. In order for this cycle to function, the old must relinquish itself to the new, necessarily. Everything is replaced, time moves forward, everything that lives must die, Balamogulis. Now, George R. Martin's previous work is any indication, then one thing that we can say with a reasonable amount of certainty is that the others, the White Walkers, are not evil, at least not in the traditional sense. Um, they are, however, in fact, unnatural. They are an abomination because they break the cycle of life and death. The others want a total victory for the side of winter. They raise the dead. So within this entire story, George R. Martin is playing on the ice and fire archetype. And for the purposes of this discussion, fire is basically life and ice is basically death. And there's a good quote from George R. R. Martin himself from 1993, and this was from an outline for A Song of Ice and Fire, and you can read that. The greatest danger of all, however, comes from the north, from the icy wastes beyond the wall, where the half-forgotten demons out of legend, the inhuman others, raise cold legions of the undead and the never-born, and prepare to ride down on the winds of winter to extinguish everything that we would call life. To extinguish everything that we would call life. So we can state reasonably that the cycle of life and death is basically the cycle of ice and fire, and it's about the balance of the two. Anything that upsets that balance is an abomination, and at the very least, unnatural. And it's not just the others. When you start to look at these things symbolically and thematically, Melisandre prays to her fire god for a summer that never ends. Life conquering death forever, ice, well, fire conquering ice forever. This is as much of an abomination as a long night. Death is a fundamental part of life. Without death, the cycle becomes meaningless. Life becomes meaningless without death. Also, something interesting about Melisandre is that she appears to be transforming into a being that's sustained by only fire, in the same way that the others are sustained by ice magic. She doesn't need to eat. She doesn't really need to sleep. And there's a quote on that, Amanda. The Red Priestess shuddered. Blood trickled down her thigh, black and smoking. The fire was inside her, an agony, an ecstasy, filling her, searing her, transforming her. Shimmers of heat traced patterns on her skin, insistent as a lover's hand. She talks about a fire and agony and ecstasy, so there's like the connection of pain and pleasure, kind of. And it's also, you can't do magic without some cost, some sacrifice. She talks about the price that she paid for her power, essentially. Um, she says, it was an art, like any other, and all arts demanded mastery, discipline, study, pain, that too. Where Lore spoke to his chosen few through blessed fire, in a language of ash and cinder and twisting flame that only a god could truly grasp. So ice and fire are really just two sides of the same coin, obviously. Um, there are those that defy the cycle through ice magic. There are those that defy the cycle through fire magic. Um, and then there's others. For a few examples of fire magic would be Barry Dondarrion, <coughs> Uh, Lady Stoneheart was brought back to life by him after days of floating in a river. Notice that each time the cycle is defied, something is lost. Beric Dondarrion finds himself more and more empty each time he's brought back. And Stoneheart is basically just a shell of her former, former self, just vengeful, consumed by vengeance. And also, George R. Martin has stated before that Beric and Stoneheart, they're corpses. They don't have heartbeats. They don't have blood. Um, 
They've paid a heavy price. They've paid a heavy price. And then there are the Whites, who are different from Stoneheart and Barrett and Bar because they are essentially just thralls. They've lost their free will entirely. They've completely lost themselves, completely under the control of the others. And then there are even more people that break the cycle. And some of my favorites are the Undying of Karth. Now, the Undying of Karth are interesting because they're essentially vampiric in nature. They lured Daenerys into the House of the Undying to essentially feed off of her magical aura, her essence. And suddenly, the visions were gone, ripped away, and Danny's gasp turned to horror. The undying were all around her, blue and cold, whispering as they reached for her, pulling, stroking, tugging at her clothes, touching her with their dry, cold hands, twining their fingers through her hair. All the strength had left her limbs. She could not move. Even her heart had ceased to beat. She felt a hand on her bare breast, twisting her nipple. Teeth found the soft skin of her throat. A mouth descended on one eye, licking, sucking, and biting. So they say, we live and we know. There seems to be a kind of arrogance about them. They feel like, because of their knowledge, because of their power, <coughs> that they deserve to live forever. But they are an abomination. They don't have the right. Valamor Gulis, all men must die. The Undying are also described as cold blue shadows, so it's similar to the way the other, others are described as cold white shadows. Um, and it's also interesting that Drogon burns the Undying one, so it's kind of maybe foreshadowing what happens to the others, maybe. <laughs> and then finally, we can talk about the Green Seers, specifically Varamir Six Skins. So at the start of A Dance with Dragons, you we encounter a dying bear of six skins. And he doesn't think that he should die. He thinks, I am so powerful, why should I? Why should I have to die? And he attempts to, th to steal Thistle's body, but something goes wrong. He's, up, he's not powerful enough to overtake it or whatever. But the point is, it's an abomination. And even his mentor, Hagon, told him the, the biggest abomination is to take away someone else's free will, to possess someone else's body. And think about what's happening when Bran is possessing Hodor. He describes Hodor as like kind of huddled in his own mind, afraid of Bran. So this is an oppressive thing that Bran is doing to Hodor. It's not good. And Bran knows it's not good, but he continues to do so. He wants to move around, he wants to walk. So he's not really considering what he's doing to Hodor's psyche. So it's something interesting to think about too. And um, that's my section. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, to put a coat on that, um, it raises questions about Bran and Blood Raven. And Blood Raven's obviously pretty ambiguous as far as what are his intentions. I'm on the Blood Raven is generally trying to help things outside of things, but you can make a case for I'm not, I think you, you can, can make a case for evil Blood Raven as well, trying to steal Bran's life force and body snatch his way out of the tree throne or something like that. I mean, it's definitely foreshadowed with Baramir Six Skins. Somebody's getting body snatched. Somebody's getting body snatched. <laughs> and a quick shout out to all the Moose Bolt On fans in the crowd out there. So what's interesting is basically all these heroes are set up to potentially violate the, I mean, John is a zombie. He's an abomination. Cold Hands is a monster, according to Bran, and John's going to be a monster too. And even Beric, like in the show, Beric is even more heroic. But in the books, Beric is, is heroic. He's defending the people. He's mostly killing bad guys. Uh, but he's a zombie. And so it's, it's kind of Machiavellian in the sense that, like, well, how far into the dark side do we need to walk in order to win this fight? And here's the thing. So we're talking about the cycle of the seasons. Well, during the long night, we might need a zombie hero because it's not spring yet and we don't have Garth the Green yet. And so Zombie John, the undead King of Winter, might be the hero that we, we get, I guess you could say. So uh, there's more to say about John and the Corn King cycle. Um, there's a cool scene. Some of you guys might know if you're into the whole Corn King thing uh, where the raven says, Corn! Corn! King! John! Snow! Sounds just like that. And it's essentially, he's, we know that he's, George does this like Sesame Street. He gives us the raven saying corn one time, and then king, and John, and snow. And then all of a sudden it's put together, corn king, John, snow. And the corn king is uh, just another name for the horn god in the cycle of nature mythology. He dies. So we've got John, 
essentially dying at the wall. He's actually dying in order to feed the wildlings, too, if you think about it, because he's murdered for letting the wildlings through the wall, and the first thing he does is feed them. So he's very much like a corn god feeding people with his death. And when he comes back, uh, it's going to be hell to pay, I think. That's, that's what's going to happen. So thank you, for everybody, for coming. We have about five minutes left, so I guess we have time for a couple quick questions. Right there. Graham uh, Howard question for you. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that many beings are trying to unnaturally break this cycle of life and death and that they're at least abominations. Uh -huh. Where do the weirwoods and cold The green seers. Um, I think the children might be an exception because they kind of work within the cycle. Like, Blood Raven says that a werewolf tree will naturally live forever if it's not cut down. So maybe the werewolves are some kind of exception. What do you think about it? It says they stand astride the river of time and they're not moved by it. They don't experience time in the same way that people do. I think the question is, do the weirwoods like being invaded by green seers? That's the answer might question. be no. If you look at it, their faces are carved and bloody. They seem to be screaming. It's kind of like a mutual parasitic relationship where the tree's feeding off the green seer and the green seer's feeding off the tree. So I'm one that believes that this, this very thing, humans weren't supposed to do this. So I think there's, a, there's a, a big sin at the root of all that. Thank you. You talked about the Green Man a lot. Could the Grey King be a counterpart to that? I'll let Amanda take that. So, so um, I think it's very possible, yes, uh, that the Grey King is a counterpart to that. So um, there's this Ironborn, uh, it's the Ironborn hero, or the Ironborn progenitor called the Grey King. Um, and in the world book, he is actually pictured as the... Um, uh, quintessential inverse parallel of Garth the Green Hand. So Garth the Green Hand was like a green man, progenitor of, of um, the, all the houses, and um, he was a fertility god, and he planted all these trees. And then the Ironborn uh, progenitor is actually killing trees in his myth. He's gray, which is a color associated with old age and death. And, so his um, beard is like a white, gray as a winter it, it, sea, right? He kind of looks, it probably looks a lot like um, Alamelda's Meldo's right now. Uh, <laughs> Even as a driftwood gray throne, as a, a winter sea. crown, yeah. too. As, yeah, gray as a winter sea, and his even his skin was gray. So just like Garth the Green had green skin, this guy had gray skin. And so he's, he's actually a perfect inverse parallel. Um, I, it, I have, it takes a lot of time to kind of describe everything, but I do have a video about it, and I do think that it is very, very possible. And yes. the brother-brother cycle is really, really embedded in the uh, Grey King mythology, as she said. You, you remember the, uh, the good brother, bad brother, like the Grey King's leal elder brother, and then there's a separate line of good brothers? So all those good brothers are showing you nature and fertility symbolism. They have tons of kids. And so they're like the one dash of green man on the Iron Islands. And if you look, they're like the good brothers. Their brothers are fighting in one of the scenes and stuff. It's great. So definitely check out the Disputed Lands YouTube channel. It's a fantastic, like, hour-long video about that. So great question. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. And I will take one more right there. Yep. Well, as everyone knows, the last book is supposed to be titled A Dream of Spring. And it's interesting because that could be a dream it's not real or a dream it's coming to fruition but it doesn't get past the point where it's 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 uh, manifested, or maybe it, it, it's got that perfect connotation of things get better. Where does this lead, lead John, do you think? So I think John, as the king of winter, like I said, he's going to get resurrected, but I think ultimately he'll be dying again in order to sort of make the seasons turn like a real king of winter. And I think what we're going to see is maybe not spring, but we'll see the planting of the first seeds for the next crop, mm -hmm. essentially. And I think, I think if I could say, Daenerys is something like of a cleansing fire for Westeros, I yes. think. She will be coming to burn out the old, yes. essentially, and pave the way for the new, the new crop, the new spring to turn. So, good question. All right, we've got to take one more. Right there. So, do you feel like the fact that Jon has ghost will... Prevent him from losing some of himself? Not... 
a, a little because Beric and Lady Stoneheart, yeah. their essence was dead. He went inside of his wolf. So, so I, think I just different. wonder if that'll make his coming back a little bit. Bingo. More quiet. Yes, absolutely. We talk about this a lot. Yep, and I've got uh, I've got a series called. Uh, Sacred Order of Green Zombies. It's a three-part series, and it addresses that question exactly because I had this thought one day. I was like, wait a minute. John's spirit is going to be preserved a little better in his wolf than wherever Barrack and Stoneheart's spirit went to because Barrack and Stoneheart are like ghosts. They do the ghost thing of like they're obsessed with the last thing they were doing when they died. Um, but I think we want a little better zombie for John, and I think we're going to get it because basically his spirit's going to go into his wolf and begin to merge with the wolf. So if we get him back out in time, we will get John, and we might even get John and Ghost merged together, and that's what I favor. So John will be like actually the wolf man. And I think you might see Ghost, the wolf, burned and sacrificed, but it won't be quite, I know, I know, I'm sorry, but his, his doggy spirit will be in John's body. So, and that's the whole point of calling him Ghost. So there you go, thank you everybody for coming. A very special thank you to all of my patrons and everyone who donated to the Con of Thrones fundraiser live stream. I couldn't have done it without you, so I hope you enjoy. Thanks, everyone, from the bottom of my fiery, fiery heart.